Some time ago, I made a three-part video series showing how to turn an IKEA utensil strainer into a hobo stove. And that series was very detailed. Well, what if I told you we could turn this same IKEA utensil strainer into a hobo stove in about five minutes using one tool, a stick? Would you be interested? If you are, keep watching. Well, I apologize if the intro sounded a little misleading because obviously you can tell from the title that this video is going to be about the siege stove. So, but it is that easy, honestly, if you can get your hands on the siege stove cross members and a stick or a rock or a hammer, you can take the IKEA utensil strainer and turn it into a very functioning stove within minutes, if that. So, how did I get my hands on the Siege Stove cross members to start with? Well, it actually stems back to the videos that I made on creating a Kea Hobo Stove. And some of my viewers were commenting that I should take a look at these and see if I could get my hands on them for review. And I had looked at them in the past, and my hesitancy wasn't on whether or not I thought they'd be effective. It was more on the cost of shipping to Canada, because the cost of shipping was actually going to be more than the cost to purchase the items. So I took a shot. I reached out to the company to see if they'd be interested in sending me a set, and they agreed. So they did send these to me quite some time ago, but I'm now getting around to making the video because, uh, well, I'll explain it a little bit more as we go along. But what I want to do is talk a little bit more in detail about these components, about the things you can do with these components, and then show you how you can turn an IKEA utensil strainer or even some common tin cans into a hobo stove. All right, I repositioned the camera down to the table so that I can give you a little bit of a close-up on the components for the siege stove, as well as show you how they can be used to turning, well, to start with the IKEA utensil strainer and some tin cans into hobo stoves. So first, the components are what you receive from siege stove. So the four cross members, as referred to, do come in this nice little nylon case. I just have a quick note on it for weight. And uh, the, in addition to the four cross members, you get one of the little P38 can openers. A uh, great little thing to have, and I'll explain why in a minute. You also get a couple of pages of instructions which are pictorial as well as written so they do offer a lot of good information and in addition to these you can go to the siege stove YouTube and their website which of course I'm going to provide in the video description below for some more detail on it so when I received them uh, I, I took them out of the pack just looked them over I weighed them 8.1 ounces so not incredibly heavy by the way they do make a titanium version which would be 40% lighter but usually about 40% more expensive so you know, it's up to you which you want to pay for. Uh, the stainless steel uh, ones are fine. I don't have the uh, the uh, titanium ones to review, of course. But uh, so what you get is two top cross members and two bottom cross members. And I'm going to start with the bottom ones because uh, they're quite significant. These actually act as a tool as well as a base for any of the hobo stove you might make. So, of course, they are fitted to go crosswise and set down. And you can see, just look at the width, how much width you get from those cross members. It's going to make for an extremely stable base. It's going to be wider than any of the pots that you're likely to put on for, except for maybe the largest can so we'll talk about that in a minute but in, in addition you know the same thing for the the cross uh, the pot stands or the top cross members which I'll talk about in one second uh, they're going to be wide enough to support even the largest of ca pots and likely frying pans as well so I'll use this one specifically to start with the bottom cross members are also the tools because what you see there are three spikes and uh, those three spikes also referred to as claws or teeth or any numbers of things are quite sharp actually sharp enough to cut yourself with if you're not a little bit careful they are used for creating holes not only in the bottom of the cans but also in the sides of the cans and i'll demonstrate that in a second so there is two bars, they both have the spikes, and they not only will create holes, but they're doing a really good job of holding on to the can of whatever you're using to keep it from falling off at the same time. So put those aside. Now here's where the real magic comes in with these, and this is the cross members that go across the top and create the pot stand. Uh, first off, you're going to see that they're quite tall this way, and that's significant, and I'll explain uh, when, when I get to making the, the IKEA hobo stove, but basically they provide a whole lot of room at the top for exhaust air, for flames to, and uh, smoke and everything else to come out of the top of the stove without dampening it down, but uh, they also allow it to be fed without taking a pot off, and I'll demonstrate that. You can see they are somewhat lightened with, with some cutouts on them as well. Now the magic is 
those protrusions on either end. Those protrusions were specifically designed for their shape, their sizes, their heights and everything else to accommodate a variety of tin cans, commonly used tin cans. And see, here's where my challenge came in. It took me a while to collect a, a number of different cans. I wanted to go from very small little cans right up to the largest cans I could use. And the company does say that this, this should work with just about any tin can on the market. So any food grade can or coffee cans or paint cans, it should work with it. Well, uh, I'm not quite sure if this is the reason, but my experience was a little bit different than that. Yes, it did fit a number of them, but just as many, it didn't fit. And I'm talking about the cross members specifically. And there was a couple challenges I'll, I'll talk about with the, the, uh, the bottom members as well, because the fangs didn't quite reach on some of the cans. So I was able to get my hand in a large, or get my hands on a large assortment of cans. I only kept a few of them now for demonstration purposes today. Uh, one of the things I found out is coffee cans aren't, or metal coffee cans, aren't all that common anymore. Most, a lot of the metal, uh, the coffee cans have a cardboard side on it. So yes, it does have a metal bottom, metal top, but a cardboard sides. Uh, the ones that I found that still had metal sides, so in other words, the whole can was made of, uh, made of metal. Now, most of them have pull tops. So that there's a pull top that, uh, uh, that you replace afterwards with a plastic top, of course, to keep the coffee fresh for a longer period of time. When you have that pull top, it leaves a quite a wide rim around the inside. And unless Unless you remove that rim, these aren't going on because they, they and I tried and, and it just kind of bent the can down so it didn't work so very well. Yeah, actually it's not a problem. As long as you have a can opener of some type, you can do that. So even this P38, which I did use for the cans I'm going to show you, I was able to open up the, the top lips. So if you can find a coffee can that's all metal and is a pull top, if you have a can opener, it's not a big deal to turn it into a hobo stove. Paint cans, well that's another issue. Yes, this will fit some paint cans, but not others. Uh, one of the things I'm noticing now about paint cans is that a lot of them have a plastic bottom on the outside. So it's a push formed uh, can itself. It's not so much the, the you know, separate bottom and sides that, that are uh, brought together. Now they're push formed and they have a little plastic thing on the bottom, presumably to keep them from being dented. And I, I could not figure out how to make good use of those cans with the fangs. Uh, it's, you know, you'd have to rip the plastic off. Uh, you know, yes, you, I guess you could do it. The question is, is I'm not sure why I'd want to do it. I'll tell you why it's recommended you can do it in a second. Why? Why am I not able to find as many cans as I'd like? I, it may be, and um, I'm looking for some guidance on this, it may be the fact that we use the metric system here in Canada, and some of the cans may be slightly off size compared to cans available elsewhere. So that may be the case, and I'll, get, I'll, get, I'll show you in a second what I'm talking about. Okay, now, just a thought on these all together in, turn, in terms of turning cans into hobo stoves. Uh, the, the concept is, is that you can very inexpensively take any uh, trash canned and turn it into a hobo stove that this would be a great set of survival items. All you'd have to have in your, your go bag or your survival bag or whatever is a set of these cross members and then as you go you can find cans that you can turn into effective stoves. The concept is valid except I don't find that many cans in the woods anymore I, I, you know, and I say that's a good thing because that means fewer and fewer people are leaving their trash behind in the cans. Urban setting, yeah, you could probably find them very quickly, but in the woods, not so much anymore. So I, it's not as valid a, a concept for me to use as a survival item. Uh, as a means of making an inexpensive stove, yeah, just save a few cans from around the house, turn it into a stove, and you've got something very functional. There are some caveats with that, which I'll explain in a minute. And the, the first one is, how long do they last? Uh, I know a lot of people like turning tin cans into stoves. Personally, I don't. Uh, it's an exercise in seeing if it can be done, but for the for the, the truth is that they don't take very long before the cans burn out and you have to replace them. Maybe that's not an issue to you. I just find it's a little bit of an annoyance to have to keep making new stoves every so often. However, having said that, it is possible. All you would need is these cross members and some cans and a stick or a stone, and you can turn a new can into a stove very, very quickly. Okay, so what I wanted to show you now is a few of the cans that I found that did work and some that didn't work. So this is a small one, and, and this you can see has been used, and I'll, I'm actually going to demonstrate with it today because there's a unique concept that I didn't realize until I received the literature that you can do with these stoves. So this can... Uh, the bottom members will fit on 
quite effectively like that, as you can see, and it didn't take much to drive them in. I'll show you how the holes are formed in a second. And the same thing with the cross members. It just happened to fit one of the settings on the very top. Actually, I might as well show you with both on just to make it more effective a demonstration. So you can see that it actually goes on quite well. We fit it down and then it's, then it will stay on fairly well now this is a re very very small can this is probably as small as you're going to want to use for a wood stove but there's a reason I chose this and I'll demonstrate that in a second so here is a larger can this one I think this was tomatoes that we turned into uh, some chili at home here and I have punched holes in it already I do have a can without any holes that I'll show how to use it it'll fit on this one quite effectively once again let's put the bottom together And I found that the size of this can worked well enough. Now, you can see I'm using my hand to push it on now because I've already pre-attached them at one point and it makes it for a very secure attachment point as you can see. Same thing with the cross members. They'll fit in one of the set of cutouts to go on there very effectively. There, okay. Now that's on there, that's very stable. It's not coming apart. So it makes for a very stable platform, both bottom and top. So it works well with that can. There I've got a, an almost instant hobo stove. However, there's another can that I have right here. And you can see how tightly they'll stay on, which is a good thing. So here is another can. It's just slightly smaller than the, than the second one I showed you, slightly larger than this one. I'm not even sure what was in this can, but the cross members won't fit. They are just, well, they're, they're, they're lined up just at the very edges, but if I was to hammer that down, the, the fangs themselves are wider than the can. If I was to hammer that down, it would just tear into the side of the can if it didn't crush the can, because I had that experience with a few of them, because this is a quite a strong rim. So if I hammer that down, it, it I mean, it may work, but it's, uh, it's, not a, it's not really sized for this can. And the same thing with the top as well. I just couldn't find the right setting on this can to make it work. As you can see, it won't go on properly. Uh, the point, only point I'm trying to make here is not every can, at least the ones here we get in Canada, will work with this, uh, with this system. Okay, now what I wanted to say, which was really very cool about this was, and I didn't realize it until I had read the literature, is that you can take two cans of differing sizes and turn them into a very functional wood gas stove. I had my doubts, but I tried it, and I am going to demonstrate it today to show you how well it actually does work. Now the company makes claims of how much better it is than a factory made one. I'll leave that up to you to decide whether you think it's more effective or better cheaper absolutely all you need is two cans so once again this is the small can that i took and used you can see it's already been used a couple times it fits on there quite well sits on and this is another can i took both ends out of and this one i know will fit the top members so by taking both ends over i can now slide that down over the top and i'll show you what it looks like inside so you see I have a inner wall and an outer wall, very much like a wood gas stove would have. Let me put the tops on because this will fit both cans quite securely when I get it into the right spot. There. All right. Now we're on. So it will hold both cans in place. And uh, the, the only thing that I was concerned about is how big the gap is down the sides and the fact that the gap was not closed at the top. So a wood gas stove works under the principle that the fuel inside the inner chamber pyrolysizes, if that's the right word, so it turns the wood and the, the combustibles in that wood into a wood gas, which are then combusted by air entering in on the top of the stove. And how the air gets in at the top of the stove, of course, is between the outer and the inner layer, air, hot air will come, well, air of all, of cold air to start with, will enter the side walls, move up the oats or the inside of those between the two walls, be heated as it does, and it, as it reaches the top of the inner chamber, the air is redirected in holes all around the outside at the very top. And what happens then, of course, is that hot, warm, or that hot air is mixed with the combustible gases being released from the woods, and they ignite. So that's where you get that classic jet appearance from coming out of the holes, or appear to be coming out of the holes. So that's how a wood gas stove works. I wondered if it would actually work if I didn't have a closed 
system at the top, would it still work? Well, it does, and I'll show you that. It will. It does work. Maybe not as effectively as a closed system, but still it works. So I thought maybe I could improve on that ever so slightly. So here is an identical can to this one, and rather than cut the bottom off of it completely, I took a pair of tin snips and just cut a hole around the edge so that it would match up more precisely. Put it back on the cross members. A little bit closer, ouch, sharp edges. That's something I'll talk about in a second. A little bit closer, so maybe now the, the air, the heated air coming up between the walls would be forced back into the inner chamber a little bit more readily and not be lost out of the top. Uh, here's the problem. Now that I've left this ring around the outside, I can't use the cross members without crushing the stove, because I did try it on another can. If I try to hammer this in, it won't, it, they sit on top, but they're not secure on top. So I, I won't be able to, uh, to use it with the cross members. I will demonstrate it, however, just to see how well it works as a wood gasifier, gasifier though. Okay, what I want to do now is show you how to use the bottom cross members to create holes in a brand new can so you can turn it into a hobo stove. Okay, so I've repositioned the camera again. We're now on the floor level of my room in the basement. And what I wanted to do is very quickly show you how to use the cross members as a tool in and of themselves along with the stick to create a hobo stove out of a can. Now I'm going to use do it with the uh, KR utensil strainer in a moment, but I want to talk very quickly about using it with a tin can and then demonstrate. So what you'll notice if I bring this up close is just how ragged and jagged the holes are on the outside. It's very easy to make the holes, it's just not very easy to make them smooth. And uh, I'll demonstrate that in a second. So a minute ago I said I had caught my finger on one of the edges. I didn't cut myself, but it shows you just how easily you could cut yourself on these holes. Uh, because the metal is just literally ripped once you, uh, once you uh, hammer through it with the fangs. Uh, you know, you can make a better, cleaner job with this if you want to. You can start by starting the hole through and then using a step drill to size the hole to a specific size and make smooth out the edges if you want to go that far. But th that's more involvement than I would want to do for one of these almost disposable hobo stoves because that's pretty much what you're creating here is somewhat of a disposable homo hobo stove. So again, this can, it worked well with. I'll can't really demonstrate again how I made this one, but I will show you pretty much in at least representation of how it was done. And then I will show you on a clean can how it's done. So to start with, you can see that the fangs are very, very sharp. Once again, a little bit of a close-up. The fangs are very, very sharp. So it took me a minute to line up on the bottom of the stove to see exactly where it was I wanted this to go. And this actually might make a good demonstration because it's pretty tight. And just Hammer it in to the fangs are flush. Take the other one, come across to the place you want to have it and hammer it down until it's flush. And now you can see just how fixed on the bottom that is. So what I've done now is I've created the base. Now, sometimes getting it off can actually be a bit of a challenge. So one thing I've learned is Use the same stick for tapping it off. Now the holes on the bottom, I'll dem let me demonstrate on the bottom of this can. So when you find your can that you want to use and you're going to you know, decide how many holes, by the way, how many holes you want to use, entirely up to you. In fact, I would recommend getting a whole bunch of cans and just experiment. Great way to learn about airflow, where do you want the holes to be, how many you want. It's a great way to experiment. At a very basis, I would say put a number in the bottom put as many as you reasonably can in the bottom because you need airflow coming through the bottom of the stove. Realize, of course, the more holes there are, the more uh, coals may fall through onto the ground. So that's a consideration. You always have to have a safe foundation for wherever you're using your stove. And then how many holes up the side? Yeah, I have two rows of holes here, somewhat uh, opposite each other, but you know, I could put another set of holes up the side here and come right up to the top. I mean, when you think about it, Look how many holes this thing has. So I don't think there is anything such thing as too many. Well, that's not quite true. You can have too much airflow. So this is a great way to experiment to find out what is too much airflow. All right, I said I would show you how that's done. So the fangs can be used. In this case, uh, I think I'll do it on the side because I'm not so sure how well it's going to work on the bottom of this. Find a spot, a spot wherever it is that you want to you use it. 
take the fang, the very, and like I said, they are very sharp, and just hammer it. Now, I may have made that hammer a little bit too hard because I can actually collapse some of the stove. Here's one thing I learned that I want to share with you. Uh, you would think you've got great leg reach by holding it way back on the handle and turning, and you have great leg reach, but I discovered these will bend in some situations. So you're actually better holding it like a key right up here, and then just turn in a couple of directions. Well, you know, that's a reasonable hole. It worked well enough, so it wouldn't take very long to create as many holes as you need around the outside. It is a very stout tool. The only caution I mentioned, once again, is rather than turning way back here, actually hold it up close to there, and that's about the only thing. All right, so what I'm going to do now is very quickly take my utensil strainer and turn it into a stove. So in order to do that, the, this was actually designed to work with the IKEA utensil strainer in that the fangs will line up with the holes on the bottom. So I guess you don't even have to hammer it in, but if you wanted to make it even more stable, you're going to want to hammer it in. So again, I'll take the, the bottom member that has the three fangs, line it up with the holes. What's this going to do, of course, is it's going to cut into those holes and create slots out of them. Don't hit too hard like I just did. I bent the bottom just ever so slightly, but uh, that's not a big deal. Where's the other cross member? Line it, it up with the holes. Tap in a little less forcefully this time. There we go. Okay, my stove is created. Take the cross members. Bring it up, make sure you can see what I'm doing here. And they will line up with a specific set of holes and we're finished. We now have a hobo stove made out of an IKEA utensil strainer. Okay, I just moved back up to the tabletop so I could give you a quick look at the hobo stove. Now, with the members, you can see how well attached they are. I mean, they're not falling off, they're, they're very well attached. So a couple of the advantages, again, are just that, how well attached they are so they're not going to fall off on you, how wide the members are, top and bottom, making for a very stable stove. And one of the big things here is this gap right here from the, from the stove to the top or where the pot would sit. That gap means for excellent airflow. It also means, let me just put a kettle on top to show you, how easy it is to feed wood in without taking anything off. Well, you can drop in as much wood as you need to. Now, one way of using a, a hobo stove, of course, is to preload it and fill it full of wood and then use a top-down burn. You won't have to feed much wood into it after that, but uh, that it gives you the option if you want to continue the, the fire going just to feed in wood very easily, as I said. Okay, so what we're going to do, put that aside now, is I'm going to set up the wood gas stove. We'll take it outside. I'm going to preload it with wood, this same wood that I have here, and we'll do a little burn just to demonstrate how this works as a wood gas stove. Okay, I've come up to work in my backyard laboratory again today. I'm not in the woods. I'm just in my backyard. Beautiful fall day, but I'm still not able to get to the woods today. So I think this will suffice for giving you the demonstration and how you can use the seed stove cross members to make a wood gas stove. So once again, here's the case they came in. Yeah, the little P38, I just wanted to make sure I didn't lose it, still sits inside. We have the two bottom members with the sharp fangs that we use to create the holes. Now you can see what I have done here. This is the can that I have used past in my experiment to make the wood gas stove. Is I pre-loaded it with wood and the wood is vertically stacked and just below the secondary jet ports that, or the secondary feed holes, I guess, that uh, I created with the seed stove components, and on the bottom, just how many holes I have in the, uh, on the bottom as well. I did not put any holes at the base on the sides. You can, and that would probably improve airflow from the, through the bottom, but as you'll see, it works effectively like this. Again, experiment. Cans are cheap. Experiment and see how it works for you. So, I have it lined up like this. There, that sits on the base quite well. This is my can emptied at both ends that's going to sit down over the top because that I know will work with the top members because it's sized to fit just nicely. And I'll get that on in a second. In fact, I'll put that on now and I'll be able to just put the whole thing over the top. All right, to get this fire going today, look at this. 
Look at the size of that. That's a piece of fat wood, one of about seven or eight, that one of my viewers sent me. He sent me seven pounds of high-grade fat wood uh, to me because he had saw in one of my videos that, uh, you know, fat wood's a little bit hard uh, to find here in Nova Scotia. It's, it is. It's, you never, I've never seen it in chunks like that here in Nova Scotia. So this, a uh, shout out to Dave Burkholder, one of my viewers, who sent me fat wood for life, I'm sure. So I thought this is a good opportunity to get out and take a few shavings off it and put it on the top so that we can create that top-down burn. And to do this, all I'm actually going to use is my pocket knife. And... Uh, I won't need too many shavings because I do have some wood shavings as well. All right, look at that. I got to tell you, when the package arrived recently, I I opened it up, and it was all wrapped in newspaper. Uh, the smell was incredible. If you have never smelt a large quantity of fat wood like this, uh, it's just I love it. I love it. I have to tell you. All right, this is likely much more than I need to get this fire going. Reach over and get the pieces that I dropped on the ground here. And I'm going to light them and put a few other wood chips on top. Likely not going to need it. I have my gloves. I have a windscreen, even though the wind, there is not much wind right now. Uh, that's not uncommon for Nova Scotia to get windy. I think I'll stack that one right down inside there and light it. And we'll get this Experiment started. True fat wood. Look how smoky it is. Get some more of these on. They're almost sticky, the fat wood is. Wow. Catching on fast. I may not even need these wood chips, but I will put them on just because you do need to get a little fire on top of any top-down burn to get started. I can actually see the resin bubbling out of the wood as it burns here. Thank you, Dave. That's, <laughs> this is amazing. little piece of fat wood fell off the side. That's why I'm on a fire safe surface. I'm just giving that a second to burn down into the wood below. And I'll put the top on. Actually, I can probably put the top on right now anyway. And it just sits on like that. It's going to take a, a couple of minutes for the top-down burn to start pyrolysizing or pyrolysis, creating pyrolysis of the wood. So what I'll do is I'll just let it start to burn for a few minutes. I'll bring you back and show you it in action and uh, what it looks like when you put a kettle on top of it as well. Okay, that only took a, a few minutes for the, the top of the wood to be ignited inside the inner chamber. Uh, one thing that I didn't anticipate, I guess I should have, was the sun. I am trying to create shadow between me and the sun, or between the stove and the sun, so that you can see what's taking place down inside. A little bit of a breeze gusting up, but hopefully it's showing up the way I can see it. But I can clearly see what appears to be jets of gas that are coming in through the secondary uh, air holes at the top of the inner can, just like a wood gas stove does. Now, not near as effective as a commercially made wood gas stove, but you know, even if it's not as effective as a commercially made one, it's the having that outer wall on there is improving the combustion inside the inner can. So, you know, whether it's acting as a windshield alone, if it's, uh, it's of course, it's keeping it warmer, the inner chamber warmer than it would without, but uh, I can clearly see the pyrolysis taking place and the jetting coming in from. Uh, the holes on the side of the inner chamber. Now one thing I want to do, I'll have to put gloves on, hopefully this will work. Now the breeze is kicking up of course, but you can still see what's taking place, is I am going to use the other can, the one that I created that has uh, a bit of a lip over the top, but as I mentioned I won't be able to use it with the, cro the top crossbars because they just uh, they won't work on. So give me a second see if I can get that on. I'll let you know whether or not I have to put the windscreen around it. 
Now, one of the nice things about wood gas stoves, if you own any, you'll know that the base of the stove, use, of the outer layer, usually remains fairly cool to the touch. So, just the same. I'm using gloves, of course. Now, let's put this other one on. And it's still not sized. Wow, huge improvement. Can you see that? Huge improvement. I think I'm going to hold something up as a windscreen. Yeah, it's, it's, it's gasifying like a wood gas stove. It is a wood gas stove. That's what I've created out of two cans. And I mentioned that you could do much better than this if you size the cans better and you can get a closure at the top, which you can with a lot with a, but using the cross members from Siege just a little difficult with this one. Uh, maybe you can find a can that'll work for you. Uh, I, could, I suppose I could have cut grooves in four sides of that to allow the cross members to stand on, but proof of concept right there. Look how well that's working now. Maybe it's not working as well. I'll try to give you the shadow view again. I wonder if I can do the shadow view and without burning myself. Yep, it's gasifying. Okay, what I'll do just to for demonstration purposes, I'm going to remove that outer layer, put the original one back on. Again, not too hot to handle. And while maybe not as effective as it was a second ago, still creates a very stable stove. And I can still see the wood gasification. And you can see the height of those crossbars really create no dampening effect. I wonder if I can back up a little bit here. Other way, Mark. Hey, no, uh, no smoke be being created, or well, very little anyway. Okay, that's all I wanted to do with this, is demonstrate how you can turn a couple of tin cans into a wood gas stove. And I already demonstrated how you can turn a utensil strainer into a hobo stove. Let's wrap this video up. Well, you can see from that demonstration just how effective that little two-can combination works as a wood gas stove. Is it as good or better than a commercially made wood gas stove? I don't think so, but it was surprisingly effective just the same. Now, I've only experimented with a couple of cans. It would be nice to have cans that are closer inside so that inner wall is a little smaller so you don't cool the air off too much and something that you can actually get that gap, top gap closed and still use the top, the top members to support a pot above. But uh, the concept is valid. You could use these to create a wood gas stove. So I've got to set back up on the utensil Trainer here to make show that as a hobo stove again. Uh, you know, I as I mentioned, I'm going to put all the information about where you can purchase these in the video description below. But Seed Stove has other components and things that and options available that you may want to look at as well. So in addition to just these, the cross members, which are of course the heart of the whole system, they actually have another complete stove made up of plates that you would use in conjunction with these to create a. It is square, although it funnels in a downward shape. A complete wood stove out of it. They also have some other accessories that you can attach onto the sides for uh, keeping things warm or making toast out of and those types of things. So it's kind of interesting that the range of things that the creator has come up with. But again, the foundation of this is the, the cross members used for making a stove out of a utensil strainer like this or out of well, again, not any tin can, not as many tin cans as I had originally hoped, but enough tin cans that I could find them in my home that once they were emptied, I can turn them into a stove. They don't last all that long in my experience, but they work. Uh, you just, like I mentioned before, you do have to be careful when you punch the metal that you're going to have some jagged holes that either flatten down with a hammer or a pair of pliers, or maybe you smooth out with a step drill as well. Uh, that, of course, is adding some complication to it, but it, they do work, right? So very much worth looking at. They're they're a nice set. I mean, at eight ounces, you can put these in your pack if you don't want to use them or create the stove now. Have them with you for the day that you do want to create the stove and know that they will work for you. Okay, that's all I have for you in this video. What I want to do now is just open this up to you. Have you used the Siege Stove cross members to create stoves with? Have you tried the wood gas stove? If you have a combination of cans that works better than what I showed you today, I'd be interested in knowing what that is. Uh, do you have any suggestions maybe for improvements and maybe what I'm doing or in the design of the cross members. But uh, yeah, I'll allow that. Just put any comments you have in the comment section below. But until next time, get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.